Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure uh, to open uh, this session, which uh, is the last in this uh, fascinating day of discussions, but it's also a standalone. Uh, this session is devoted, uh, um, or, or the entire conference is uh, uh, produced, offered, conducted, hosted, thank you. Uh, by the President uh, Meir Shamgar Center for Digital Law and Innovation. And this uh, particular session is uh, in memory of Dr. Joshua uh, Rottenstreich. Uh, Mr. Rottenstreich was uh, a prominent lawyer and a public figure in Israeli society. Uh, he was the head of the Israeli bar in uh, for, for a decade, uh, from 1962 to 1972, and then the president of the Israeli uh, Press Council from 1974 to 1988. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. I would like to acknowledge uh, our former Chief Justice, Professor Asher Gunis, and our former uh, Deputy Chief Justice, uh, Hanan Meltzer, for joining us, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, we have uh, distinguished guests, which I will introduce shortly, but before that we have uh, two introductory greetings, and first is our very own Dean, Professor Ishai Blank. Please, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, so thank you, Michael, for your introduction, um, and thanks, uh, Niva, for inviting me to this uh, fascinating panel. Um, I would also like to greet um, former President Grunis and former Vice President um, Meltzer, um, and especially to, uh, to say how honored we are and happy to have Professor Robert Post um, of Yale Law School to finally um, visit us here um, and give us uh, a speech on a topic um, that can't be more intriguing, important, and timely. Um, I think one of the um, signs of how critical and weird our times is, our times are, um, is that almost every concept, every word, um, has become so laden with meaning that it's enough to say the internet, and it's already um, ripe with meanings um, and significance, and internet and democracy, um, liberalism, all the words that were kind of used almost regularly um, have in the past you know, few years become contested, uh, problematic, um, and another um, I would say, source for uh, reflection, which we would hope um, Professor Post will shed some light um, on. Um, um, I think that, um, you know, without, um, without taking too much time, um, one of the things that um, is particularly important in what this conference is about and about the attempt to contemplate concepts such as democracy, the internet, um, and the very, I would say, foundations of our polity, um, is that it is now um, become not just uh, contested in the sense of what is democracy, um, what lies between democracy and liberalism, um, but also who are the entities that are occupying um, the space um, of the polity. And uh, of course, we're used to thinking about um, non-human um, actors in the sense of animals um, and the place that they are assuming um, in our polity, but also um, the infamous or the unavoidable chat GPT um, when I'm conversing with this um, machine, um, I just cannot let go of the thought that there is actually um, something going on there. And I think that as time goes by, um, we will be faced more and more um, with the challenges, um, um, actually, of is it possible that there is some kind of a sanctioned being there. I know that many like to say, well, it's not artificial and it's not um, intelligence kind of thing about AI. Um, but even if it's now the same, I actually think that we will have um, to think uh, more and more about the fact or the option or the possibility that actually something is there um, and the way um, that it also might change some of our concepts. And I think that this is one of the things that uh, Professor Post um, is most well known for, um, is his ability, his unique ability um, to profoundly rethink um, the very concepts um, that we take for granted. Um, and just to take one of the concepts which I assume um, will, uh, um, will preoccupy uh, Professor Post, which is speech. Um, how, um, how does the concept of speech actually changes or change um, when machines like ChatGPT um, are doing that? 
Um, and what happens actually when um, the idea of speech, which for a couple of decades um, at least um, kind of uh, was unique to, uh, to humans, um, is now spreading to non-human entities, um, how will it affect um, our law, our thinking, um, and our democracy? So um, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward um, for a panel that will be no less than fascinating. Thank you, Ishai. Uh, as mentioned, uh, this panel is dedicated uh, to Mr. Joshua Rothenstreich. This is the second year that our law school hosts uh, a, an event in memory of uh, Mr. Rothenstreich, and we are, I'm delighted to invite uh, Ms. Daniela Eliagon uh, to uh, talk to us to, to about him uh, as a representative uh, on behalf of the family. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. And my mother apologizes she couldn't be here with us today. I'll try and fill in for her as best I can. She left me some notes. I'll try to give them up to speak in English. I hope it's okay with everyone. So welcome. Thank you for coming both from far and from here to this very interesting day and to this talk as well. The topic selected back in September we thought is interesting. Well, let's talk about free speech and freedom of expression in the digital platforms. Okay, this is cool. It's been a few months mm -hmm. and it's becoming ever so relevant with every passing day. So now when we're talking here every almost daily about freedom of expression, human rights, various constitutional subjects, are we headed for a coup d'etat? We're not really sure. And this conference comes just at that time. My grandfather was a lawyer. He studied law back in what was then Poland, today Ukraine. And he came to Israel in 1933, founded the Israeli Bar Association. He's the first president. He was a lawyer for most of his life. And in addition to that, he was a journalist. Actually, coming to Israel, even though he completed his law studies, he was certified, he was licensed. He couldn't find a job as a lawyer, so he worked as a journalist. And a few years pass, he has a daughter going to kindergarten, my mother's sister, Ruti. And my grandmother approaches one of the, one of the other mothers, asking if she can help give him a job as a lawyer. And so he did come into contact with a lawyer, a fairly strong lawyer who said, yes, you can come work, but you need to bring your own desk and your own chair. And this is the start of everything. From there on, he's making one connection after the other, and he starts his job in law. And he's a man of compromise always looking for one compromise instead of battling things out. He'd rather have both parties find a seat, speak, and come to a resolution. And looking today, we keep asking ourselves in the family, what would he say now? What would he do? Would he still try and go for a compromise with everything that's going on? Or did we just go too far this time and the, comp and the compromise is not in the books? So it's important to say that he was well respected on both sides of the political map. He was a good friend to Begin. He was a friend to Diane. He was very well acquainted and, and on fairly good terms with Rabin on the other side. And the proof we see to this is that he was a member of various commissions. 
trying to investigate things, coming to resolutions. And one of the things we can see here is <coughs> that he was also well connected to who was at that point the Minister of Justice, Pinchas Lozen. He served in the committee that tried to, that worked out the model for the Israeli judicial institutions and how they will be built, who will make, who will be there, who will hold office. These are the exact institutions that are now in the crosshairs. And now with everything that's going on, given he was one to look at both the judicial side and the journalistic side, we believe he would be totally opposed to what's going on. He would, the way he would react forcibly to this, to people saying, let's send to hell on a one-way ticket those that fought to make this country what it is. What would, he have, what would happen if it was in his day that we had social media? How would he, have, he look at the possible infringement of privacy law, privacy rights? How would he look at the people trying to take us apart? What solutions would he offer? On the one side, freedom of speech is something he was extremely passionate about. He, it couldn't be done without freedom of speech. And if I look back, there was in the 60s a day without newspapers in Israel. Newspapers were not printed. It was the first time the Israeli media or the Israeli journalistic <coughs> environment went on strike. There was a way, there was an idea to make it easier to give, to block their freedom of speech. And the system simply didn't work. For one day, no paper was printed. And this is in his time as a journalist, as head of the Journalistic Council. This is something completely unheard of. And now people are walking into the street. How would he do? How would he deal with it? Looking at the extreme animalization by politicians their animal-like behavior, what would he say? On social media, not in social media, we keep seeing this all around us. We my mother strongly believes uh, that he would be a force to reckon with, with, that he will simply not let it go. Those that allow themselves to harm the public, he would not stand for. He would probably be fighting the idea of fake news. This thing changes our reality, not necessarily for the better. Everyone here in attendance, everyone here that was speaking today, we are calling you to discuss this, to voice your opinions on this. How do you think this can be controlled? How can we take the reins back? How can we stop hurting the children? How can we stop hurting our own safety? What would you suggest? Please suggest solutions. Leave here today with ideas of how to solve this in Israel and outside of it. Because with everything good in these platforms, they have true dangers, true toxicity, and this is not something we can just avoid. In our case, for example, these platforms are currently a machine producing poison. It's dreadful and it's ruining the country.
this can happen anywhere. The bots are just going around spreading their lies and their poison. And these are tough questions. They're not simple at all. This is a challenge for every one of us, everyone here. There is a lot to do. Can you find this, any answers to it on how to give us a better outcome? Freedom of expression is so important. How can we live without it? How my grandfather would have fought for this. And today, under this, people are allowing themselves to say and to write violent things, to, to spew pure insults. Everything is legitimate without any way of bridging this gap, every, any way of saying this is it, this is as far as you can go just to earn points with someone else just to release it all online. And there are those that don't find this interesting at all. Not the danger, not the end result, and not the well-being of others, the well-being of the public, the safety of the individual, the safety of the public, and the safety of the country. I do hope that during this day and in other days like this, you will come with ideas to better things for us and for everyone in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniela. These are important points that I'm, I'm sure are on the minds of, of everybody in this, in this room today. Uh, we will have our keynote and then a comment and then uh, some discussion uh, with the audience and we have some uh, key figures here in the room, uh, uh, experts in freedom of expression and democracy. It's a great pleasure uh, and honor to have with us today Professor Robert Post to deliver the keynote address. Professor Post is a world-renowned scholar specializing in constitutional law and particularly freedom of expression and academic freedom. He was a law professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and then joined Yale Law School, where he was dean for eight years from 2009 up to 2017. He's a member of the American Law Institute and a fellow of both the American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Post is one of the six trustees of Meta, Facebook's oversight board, which, according to its website, the, 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 the trustees are responsible for safeguarding the independence of the board. We have a board member over there, uh, Amy Palmo, whom we have heard uh, this morning. Today, <laughs> Professor Post will be speaking about democracy and the internet, and will analyze the impact of the internet, and particularly social networks, on our democracy. As we are struggling here in Israel with uh, big constitutional issues, challenging constitutional issues, it will be intriguing to see the connections between the general topic and our particular struggles uh, for which we have been going out on the streets for the past 18 weeks, if not more than that. Professor Post uh, will deliver the keynote and then we will hear a response from <coughs> Professor Amnon Reichmann uh, from the University of Haifa uh, Law School and then we will have some time for uh, discussion. Um, Professor Reichmann, uh, I will introduce you now to, in, in, uh, you know, to save some time later on uh, at the University of Haifa Law School where he teaches and researches issues of administrative and constitutional law. He's an expert on human rights, legal philosophy, and has also discussed issues of democratic deficiencies of various kinds. kinds. Over the years, he has, draw, he has been uh, drawn more and more into the digital environment as well. Professor Post, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thank you to Tel Aviv Law School and Dean Blanc and uh, to Neva um, for this wonderful invitation and this great day of discussion addressing the questions that Daniela put on the table. I just want to say as a personal matter, it's really a great privilege for me to be here in Tel Aviv at this time and 
under these circumstances and to watch these uh, struggles. I wish I could do more, um, but it's, it's extremely moving to me to be here now with you. So um, I'm going to be talking about democracy and the internet. Um, Karl Marx, you might remember him <laughs> a long time ago, he taught us that the structure of uh, societies was heavily dependent upon the means that society used to produce and to distribute goods. And what Marx missed that we are in the midst of now is that the structure of a society is also very much determined um, by the means which it uses to produce and distribute uh, not merely information, but the forms of social solidarities that communication uh, produces. And as these forms of communication change, so does the structure of a society change. Think what happened in Europe um, in the 16th and 17th centuries after the development of printing. It created the public sphere and the public sphere in turn made possible another term we'll be talking about a lot and have talked about today, democracy. You know, without the public sphere, there would be no democracy. And now, for the last generation, we are in the midst of the transformations that are accompanying uh, the change from information that is analog to information that is digital, and then and the distribution of this digital information through this amazing thing, um, the internet. And this change is, uh, is altering the structure of societies around the globe. We are all feeling its uh, implications. Law, of course, is a, a lagging indicator. We feel something wrong in our lives and we turn to law to fix it. You know, there's something going wrong here. Let's pass a law. Let's create a regulation. Let's change it. Let's reduce the sources of our discomfort. But unless we are accurately analyzing what the problem is, all the legal interventions in the world are not going to make it better. So we have to pause and we have to think, what are the dislocations being caused by the internet? We've already seen, in my view, too many legally incoherent interventions to fix the problems of the internet. In, in my country, internet has been shielded by um, Section 230, which we talked about before, which shields uh, internet uh, providers from liability that we ordinarily apply to other means of mass um, communication. And there's a debate in my country, should we repeal Section 230? Um, and that basically corresponds to um, the question, the assumption that if we could apply to the internet the same forms of legal liability, defamation law, privacy law, et cetera, et cetera, if we could apply all of that to the internet the way we apply it to newspapers or to the mass media, like the broadcasters, we would fix the problem. But that presupposes that the issues and the problems caused by the internet are the same as the problems caused by previous mass media. And that's the question I want to discuss with you today. Does the internet cause unique problems which require different forms of legal intervention than we have in the past applied to mass media? In the terms in which we were talking earlier today, um, should do we need to regulate different forms of speech which are not presently illegal? Awful speech, we called it, rather than uh, merely illegal speech. So um, why might we do such a thing? It's because um, the internet uh, might be different in crucial ways than previous forms of mass um, communication. And so not the dangers posed by the internet to democracy might be different than those which we have developed forms of legal control um, uh, in the past. And so um, what might those be? I'm, I am by no means qualified to give you a comprehensive canvas, um, but I'm going, to talk, um, I'm going to talk briefly and at a high level of generality about three differences between the internet and any previous form of mass communication in human history, and then talk about some dangers that these differences that make the internet unique uh, might cause to democracy and therefore which might require different forms of legal intervention than any that have existed for other forms of mass communication. So one um, difference is what I'll call zero marginal information cost. A second difference is integration with life tasks. And a third difference in the internet is its interactivity. 
So let me talk about the first difference between the internet and previous forms of mass communication. It's because it's digitized. Um, and because it spreads information in a virtually frictionless way, it has almost zero marginal information costs. It costs the same thing for me to send information to one person as to a thousand persons, speaking roughly. Or it costs the same thing for me to send an email to my next door neighbor and for me to send an email to someone um, in um, Israel, right? And so the internet, this causes um, differences between the internet, the zero marginal information cost, um, between the internet and any form of prior mass communication. Let me uh, just mention three differences that this, um, that this causes. The first is scale. Information spreads on the internet at a scale that is orders of magnitude greater than that obtainable by any previous uh, means of communication. For example, uh, Meta, Facebook, had about three billion users um, during the first quarter of 2022, three billion. I mean, I don't think there's a movie that has been seen by three billion people or a newspaper read by three billion people. Three billion people. That is an order of magnitude that almost defies human comprehension. So first difference is scale, and that's caused by the zero marginal information cost. Second, I'll call it virality. And by that, I'm not referring to the quantity of information. I'm referring to um, the speed by which information is distributed because it's digital. And so when we refer to virality of information on the internet, we're referring to the almost, again, unimaginably rapid pace by which information spreads from person to person um, in the virtual public sphere. This is, again, totally different phenomenon than anything we've seen before. And the third difference is cosmopolitanism. Um, the scale and virality of information spread on the internet renders national borders almost, not quite yet, but almost um, wow. irrelevant. And this has put intense pressure on the national public spheres. So in the past, it made a great deal of sense to speak about the public sphere as tied to a particular nation state. We could speak of the German theater, we could speak of American cinema, we could speak of the French novel or the English press. Um, but the medium of the internet is um, pretty cosmopolitan, and we can now begin to perceive the possibility in which there'll be a virtual public sphere which will not be tied to any given nation state. It's not realized now, but it's certainly going to happen within the next 20 years. Something like that um, is going to be happening. So that's three differences caused by the marginal information cost being almost zero on the internet. Second difference on the internet is um, that we typically now access it through our phones. And these have become all-purpose tools for negotiating life tasks. We get directions from our phone, we order food, we contact friends, we get local news, we find partners, we charge expenses. This is all done through the common instrument of the phone, through the, um, through the internet, and no past uh, mass communication medium worked um, in this way. You know, I, when I was growing up, I watched a great deal of television, or I would spend Sunday mornings reading um, the newspaper. But the virtual public sphere is now integrated in my life like no other means of uh, mass communication. Um, and it's, therefore, its influence has become pervasive mm -hmm. and it's become um, inescapable. And uh, this means that our dependence on the communicative structure of the internet for daily life practices, this is something new in the world. A different form of integration between a means of mass communication and my life, the daily way in which I live my life, second difference. And so the third difference um, is that um, the internet is uh, interactive. So in traditional mass media, we would have a speaker who would address a, a large audience we sat in the movie theater and we watched uh, the latest film, or we would sip our coffee and read a newspaper, or we lie in bed and watch our favorite television commentators. But the rise of the internet has been unique, really unique, because of its ability to facilitate interactive um, communications. And that, in turn, has prompted the rise of social media networks um, like Facebook, which are built on this principle of interactivity. And so we could say in some dimensions, um, the internet uh, via these media is built on the principle of sustained conversations over space. 
um, in ways that were like in, impossible um, beforehand. So um, that, you, that feature of the internet has had a number of really important consequences. Let me just mention two. One is the loss of epistemological authority, and the second is polarization. So epistemological authority. Traditional media had gatekeepers. We all know this. We were talking about it earlier in the day. The gatekeepers vouched for the um, authenticity and the epistemological validity of the information they distributed. The editors of newspapers and magazines put their professional reputation uh, on the line in terms of what they were distributing to the general public. Um, and that meant that traditional mass media were controlled by elites. Uh, and um, it was quintessentially a top-down phenomenon. But by contrast, social media like Facebook, which are built on this unique principle of interactivity, have decentralized and dispersed conversations among the users. You can't think of them really as top-down in the same sense. They're structured by the algorithms that Facebook uses, but nevertheless, we participate in them in a way that can evade and often does evade um, this top-down gatekeeping um, function. And so the people who uh, participate in a medium like Facebook are less like the readers of a newspaper than they are like persons who gather at the street corner to talk or persons at the office who um, congregate around the water cooler and, and uh, have conversations. And this has very important consequences for the idea of epistemological validation. So in the past, um, uh, in the past, gatekeepers vouched for the epistemological authority of the news they conveyed. But in Facebook, there are no elite guarantors of epistemological authority. And in fact, if the epistemological authority produced on social media like Facebook is more like the self-reinforcing circles of gossip of traditional um, societies. And tr gossip is very much celebrated by many anthropologists because it produces a node of resistance to centralized authority. Um, but the other side of that coin, of course, is that gossip creates self-sustaining groups um, who, are, uh, who have solidarity with each other. I have solidarity with the people with whom I'm gossiping. And the dynamics of a gossip circle um, becomes the measure of truth and falsity. So epistemological authority gets dispersed to circles of gossip, which are occurring in um, cyberspace. Now, traditional gossip was, of course, an analog. Pre-modern gossip was a face-to-face -face phenomenon. And so as large publics in the modern nation state form, gossip became less and less important um, as a medium of um, communication because of its limited uh, range. But the internet creates, for the first time, the possibility of large virtual gossip groups that are connected through the medium of the internet. And the implications of this for epistemological authority are um, enormous. And they also have large implications for the phenomenon of polarization. So it is true that traditional media targeted discrete groups. You know, the, a French sociologist writing at the turn of the 20th century would say, you know, give me a man's newspaper and I'll tell you their political party and so forth. So the mass media were um, uh, dialectically connected to groups. Um, but the difference about Facebook is that it creates groups in ways that the mass media before were identifying and catering to a group. In the modern social media world, we create the groups that we find through each other, through this, um, through this medium. And these groups are integrated into the everyday life of their participants in the way I was describing before. The internet now is not just a means of abstract communications. It's a way of living a life. And so these groups become extremely important um, form, create extremely important forms of uh, social solidarity. And the authority within the group becomes an extremely important phenomenon um, a factor for me as a participant in the group. Now, within the gossip group, um, you always have an inside and an outside. You know, in ordinary life, who you gossip with tells you a lot about who's in and who's out. That's the words we would use in, in English. And so the idea of an insider and an outsider, and now think about polarization, is essentially committed to this idea of a gossip group. These are, these are mutually constitutive concepts. And so by creating through interactivity these gossip groups, 
it's also creating the distinction between someone on the inside and someone on the outside. Now, I'm not saying that that is what polarization is, but it certainly is homologous to the kind of polarization we are now experiencing in the public space. So to review, I've identified three ways in which the internet as a medium for mass communication is different. One, zero marginal information cost. Two, uh, it's integration into everyday life. And three, interactivity. And I've touched upon some of the implications of these differences. And what I want to discuss now is the question of do these differences pose unique dangers to democracy? The democracy which is so precious to us and which is the form of governance that we are committed to. And of course, you know, much, much, much could be said, but um, for reasons of time and uh, limitations of my brain, I'm just going to mention six <laughs> threats which are really, I think, unique caused by the internet and therefore might require unique forms of legal intervention. Right? That's the logic I'm pursuing. So first, let's talk about this loss of epistemological authority. Um, we know that every society requires a stable form of epistemological authority in order to um, structure itself. And this is especially true for modern society because we, moderns depend so heavily upon the authority of expertise. And this is a result of the division of labor. Almost everything we do requires the epistemological authority of expertise. We don't know how to fight COVID without the expertise of public health or medicine. We don't know whether nicotine causes cancer. We don't know whether climate change is man-made or not. Um, we don't know almost anything now. It all comes from expert knowledge. Our knowledge of immediate sensory experience, very small part of our lives. Very large part of our lives comes from the disciplinary expertise that is centered in places like this, in uh, universities. Um, but what we have seen in recent decades is an attack on the epistemological authority of expertise, of which, in my country, the attack on universities, which you may have to suffer like we are suffering in the United States, um, is an example, so was the opposition to COVID vaccinations. And I'm a, an American pragmatist. I always think, you know, you give someone a strong enough interest and they'll come around because they, and uh, so I thought when COVID hit, everyone would realize we need the doctors to help cure it. I was in, and to see the resistance at that level in the face of death, this is an astonishing experience for an American pragmatist, let me just say. It leaves you the sort of thing of what is going to reach, reach you here, right? So in the past, um, forms of epistemological authority have been undermined by new structures of communication. So the invention of printing in the 15th century had that effect. So you might know that, say, before printing, um, Bibles were quite rare. They were handwritten. They were expensive. But the church forbade you from reading the words of the gospel. You could only know the path to salvation. You could only know what Jesus taught you if you went through the priest, right? There was a form of epistemological monopoly of the route to salvation by the Catholic Church. What happened to that monopoly? It was undermined by the invention of printing. When Bibles became cheap, they could be translated into vernacular languages. Everyone could read the words of Jesus for themselves. And what was the upshot? <laughs> Two centuries of war, the Reformation, um, conflicts like the Peasants' War in uh, Germany, you lose epistemological authority, you lose the structure by which society decides the difference between truth and um, falsity. The antinomian implications of the printing press were enormous, and it took us centuries to develop forms of epistemological authority to substitute for um, the monopoly position that the church had um, created. So we're in the same position now. The zero marginal information cost of the internet has made information cheap. Everyone can now get information about anything they want. And as a consequence, everyone considers themselves to be an expert about everything. Right? Um, you, want, you want to know something? You just look it up on the internet. It's cheap. It's quick. My sister, she goes to the doctor. And before she goes, she looks it up on the internet. And that poor doctor has to answer a lot of questions because my sister sometimes thinks she knows more than the doctor. Uh, I've seen now signs in doctor's office, your Google search is not equivalent to my MD degree. Um, that's an example of what it means to lose epistemological authority because we think we know. And you know, we do know, and, and that access to information is really important. But 
the loss of authority, the loss of trust in authority, that, that has huge implications for stability and for social order. Um, and um, of course, that loss of authority is magnified by the creation of gossip groups that we were talking about earlier, because the authority then gets put into the gossip group. It comes into the circle of people that can be quite large that you're talking to and whose authority you respect in the name of the social solidarity of the group that you have created in virtual uh, space. And the implications of this for democracy are profound. As we lose the ability to identify figures of authority whom the general public can trust to distinguish truth from fiction, we correspondingly lose the ability to believe in, a, in common facts. And Hannah Arendt has taught us, you know, you can't have a political world unless we have common facts. We don't inhabit the same world. We cannot have a democracy. We can't even have a political um, space. We can't decide, you know, what policy interventions to have unless we know whom to trust <coughs> about, you know, climate change or automobile accidents and seatbelts, et cetera. That can only happen when we have a common faith in disciplinary methods or common faith in facts and by unleashing a kind of uh, uh, epistemological antinomianism, the internet threatens the capacity of, doc of democracy for self-governance. So that's, that's a unique threat that we need to think about. Um, often it goes under the name of misinformation, but I think that's the deep process of what's going on. Second danger, um, this goes to the nature of a public. So in ancient Greece and Rome, a public was a group of people that could assemble in the agora within the reach and sound of a human voice. That was the public for the Greeks or the Romans. Um, that's not the public for us. With the invention of printing, um, we developed um, the, the idea of the public and the public sphere. This was large groups of strangers uh, who were exposed to the same stimuli, same newspapers, the most important um, part of that. And um, theorists at the beginning of the 20th century began to, began to seek to understand the difference between being a member of a public and being in a crowd or a mob. So it was said that publics created by, uh, by newspapers and magazines, people read these, uh, these, uh, these magazines, these, uh, these circulations, they gathered in small groups to talk about them, and the information in previous forms of mass communication spread at the pace of these analog um, conversations. It gave people time to think about what they had read, but it was under the tutelage, let's say, of the gatekeepers who gave them that information. Um, crowds or mobs, right, by contrast, were theorized as people who were, again, simultaneously exposed to the same thing, but in person and face to face. And whenever you see writing about crowd, crowds or mobs, it's always through metaphors like contagion, emotion, the feeling swept through the crowd. That's the way we speak about a crowd. Um, and um, you might think about the difference in modern terms in Daniel Kahneman between type one and type two thinking, the former being immediate and emotional, the second being more reflective and slower. So a danger of the internet, um, which it might pose uh, to democracy, is that the virality of information turns a public into a crowd, of which you might think of a flash mob, which the internet makes possible as a physical manifestation. So the zero marginal information cost uh, of information on the internet means that we're in a new world where information is no longer a scarce commodity. Most economists think about information costs. Now, of course, we know, as we were saying earlier in the day, that the scarce commodity is attention, not information. So the way information spreads on the internet mm -hmm. is ways that are designed to gather, to compel um, attention. And that means typically through, in a, in a human way, uh, emotions like anger or affection or whatever it is. And this um, can slip, make us slip into kinds of immediate uh, reactions. We know from certain studies, you know, if you have emoticons of certain kinds, it arouses um, um, not reflection, but kind of the reverse. But democracy, presupposes a public who thinks, not a public who acts like a mob. And um, if you have a public that is turned into a mob, the question is, can it have a democracy at, at all? And I think that's a, a real question. And it's reinforced by the fact that the internet is now integrated into everyday life. So these emotions are not just things in the abstract. They are things that determine almost 
the way in which you navigate um, everyday life. Um, and so the internet as a medium may privilege immediate reactions that marginalize self-conscious thoughtfulness and contemplation. And the result may be a kind of mob mentality characterized by rapid and instantaneous responses that may be inconsistent with democracy. Something to think about. Third unique danger that might be caused um, uh, to democracy by the internet, and this concerns issues of scale. So um, the vast dimensions of the internet produces forms of harm that I can only de describe as um, stochastic. So in traditional freedom of speech terms, um, we try to isolate the, rela the causal relationship between a particular speech act and a particular harm. We say, did this speech create this harm? Did it create a clear and present danger of this harm? We ask about the causality between a particular act of communication and a particular harm that we want to avoid. Um, but um, when we are distributing speech at the scale of the internet, um, this idea of discrete causality becomes almost uh, meaningless. And we have to think instead in terms of the statistical probabilities um, of harm. Uh, and, and yet, I'm here to tell you um, that we do not at present have the legal capacity or the legal framework to assess um, stochastic harm that might be caused by speech in any way um, that would do anything other than overregulate speech. If we suppress every communication which might, over large numbers, cause harm, we would have very precious little speech left. And yet, harm is, is mediated by this um, by the fact of statistical probability now and not discrete causality. So it's very hard for us. We don't, we don't have the conceptual apparatus to know how to assimilate these forms of harm and yet protect freedom of expression. We simply lack the intellectual framework to do this. Third point. Fourth point. Um, mm -hmm. The internet, I think, um, causes uh, us to lose um, a grip on what the public sphere is itself. In every sophisticated legal system with which I'm familiar, there's a distinction um, between speech to the public and private speech. We give added constitutional protections to speech that is a matter of public concern, or speech that is about a public official, or about a public figure. The idea of public is essential um, to that speech which gets greater protection, and we tend to give less protection to purely private uh, speech. And the reason why we give uh, protections to speech that is directed to the public is in a democracy, we want the state to be accountable to public opinion. And speech directed to the public is that speech which is involved in the formation of public opinion. So it's essential to protect that speech if we want to have democratic accountability. Conversely, speech that is purely private, when I speak to you as a private individual, your dignity is at stake. The reciprocity and relationship between the two of us is at stake. And the law tends to intervene to protect the dignity of private persons with regard to private speech. That's the structure of free speech protections, more or less, in almost every country. And one signal that, again, is very common among legal systems that we have for speech directed to the public is that not what it's about, but the fact that it's given to the public, it's distributed to the public at large. If I'm standing on the street corner and I hand out a leaflet to five people, if they're strangers, that will be read by the legal system as public speech because it's directed to strangers. The best example of this is the news media. Why do we give such protection to the news media? Paradigmatically, the news is communication directed to strangers and given out to strangers. Now, this legal architecture depends upon a public-private distinction. And it's exactly this legal architecture that is undermined by the internet, right? Because even the most personal communication on the internet can often achieve a wider circulation than do articles of public concern in a newspaper. On the internet, the personal becomes um, public. And this causes intense legal disorientation when the first principle of freedom of speech is to distinguish public from private speech, and yet the internet is um, undermining our capacity to make this distinction. And this is causing profound dislocations in the constitutionalization of speech on the internet. We don't know how to classify it. 
because we don't know yet what the public sphere is in the, in the internet as distinct from ordinary forms of mass communication where we have a very distinct mm -hmm. idea of what the public sphere is. So that's the fourth point. Fifth point um, concerns the idea of cosmopolitanism. So all systems of freedom of speech with which I'm familiar, at root, if you really press them, they protect speech because of the relationship between a demos and a state. So the state wants to be accountable to the views of its citizens, the public will, the popular will, however you conceptualize that. And so the state has to listen to the people. And there's a reciprocal relationship, therefore, between a national public sphere and uh, the protection of speech in any given nation state. Um, the cosmopolitanism of the internet, because of zero marginal information costs, because, of, uh, because it travels around the globe, undermines the national public um, sphere. And it undermines, therefore, the rationales which have to date sustained the strength of protections for freedom of expression. There is really no reason in the United States why the American government should be responsive to the opinions of the Russian people. And yet um, the internet, more and more, is going to allow for opinion to become a cosmopolitan phenomenon and is therefore going to undercut the basic justifications for freedom of speech, which have um, created the architecture with which we're all familiar. This is a very profound consequence. We're going to see its implications, I think. Um, I mean, we can talk about human right protection for speech, but I think they're parasitic on this deeper point about the nation state and the demos. And the sixth danger I want to talk about is something that we've already spent some time talking about um, today. And this derives from um, the immense scale of the internet. Um, and this scale, in my view, uh, makes the regulation of the internet incompatible with law, law qua law. And this is a point which I think has been um, seminally conceptualized by, um, by Neva. Um, and you heard it today in the paper by uh, Neva and Mayan. Um, and they um, write about how the operation of law um, always depends upon the exercise of human judgment in the articulation and application of norms. And yet the internet is far too big, far too big um, to be regulated through the exercise of human judgment. So during the first quarter of 2022, Facebook alone took down 152 million posts. That's in one quarter, three months, 152 million discrete posts. And these removals resulted in about uh, 2.5 uh, 2, 2 million appeals. Now, I don't know of a human institution that can function at that um, scale. No court can do that. No court can function at the level of 150 million um, every, um, every three months. And that is not even to mention the posts that should have been taken down that weren't. These are only the posts that were um, taken uh, down. So human judgment does not ceases to operate at this scale. We're small, after all. And that means that the real governance of the internet functions at the level of AI, of algorithms. Um, and these algorithms, of course, continuously learn and evolve as we learn. But I want to say, and I want to make this as an ontological argument, these algorithms can never substitute for the human judgment, which is at the essence of law. Okay? Um, and the issue, um, uh, and for me, that's because judgment comes out of Kant's third critique. When you issue judgment, you're always appealing to a census communist. You're appealing to the sense of community in which you as a person um, participate. And the judge's pronouncement has authority because the judge commits to live in the community constituted by the judge's uh, judgment. There's always a reciprocal relationship between the judge and the community made by the judge. AI, by definition, cannot commit to anything because it's not human. It can't live in the community. It can't be a member of the community. It can't be bound by the norms which it itself is articulating. So there is an ontological difference between judgments made by algorithms and machines and judgments made by humans, judges. Right? Uh, and if that's true, we face a problem, which is that the speech of the world is being governed by forms of decision making, which are by definition not law. So what are we going to do about that? And the, the, the answer, I think, is we need to find ways in the future 
to politic politically legitimate, those are the terms I would use, not train, but politically legitimate the judgments of um, AI. So um, as was mentioned, I'm a trustee of the Facebook Oversight Board. Nothing I am saying now has anything to do with the Facebook. I'm speaking entirely on my own. Uh, you should, uh, it should be obvious. Um, uh, that board decides something like 50 cases a year. And as you heard, we have like 2 million appeals. So we articulate a norm like at court, and then we expect it to govern what's happening on the internet. But that isn't what actually happens. What happens is we articulate a norm that gets translated into machine talk, which governs the internet. And there is a gulf there, which is enormous, which is ontologically deep, which distinguishes law from mechanism, and which um, somehow has to be closed. So one possibility building on Neva's work is to imagine, for example, if the oversight board were to have its own AI and would politically legitimate it by reference to the relevant stakeholders and have them train the AI so it gets its political legitimacy from the participation in the training, you might imagine a world in which humans come in after the AIs have battled. I'm just building on, on Neva's work here. But that seems to me a challenge that we're going to have to face. We're going to need to close the gap um, between law and the governance of something at the scale of um, the internet. So um, uh, I've, I've listed for you six dangers, which I think the internet may uniquely pose as distinct from prior um, forms of mass communication to modern democracies. These are the loss of epistemological authority, the substitution of a crowd for a public, the creation of stochastic harm, the loss of the public-private distinction, the loss of a distinctively national public sphere, and the divide between law and a machine. And um, I, I'm doing this um, not because I know that the internet's causing these dangers, I'm simply putting them on the table to inspire research to see whether these potentialities are, being, are real um, in the world. Uh, notice that some of these dangers, there are obvious legal remedies for them. Law can intervene to slow things down on the internet, to make it less like a crowd. For other things, the remedy of law is a lot less clear. I don't know how you remedy the loss of epistemological authority, because the loss of trust goes all the way down. It's elephants all the way down. I don't know how um, uh, law is going to end the polarization caused by gossip groups. Gossip groups, in fact, cause um, polarization. I don't know how the law is going to reconceptualize freedom of speech in a world of um, stochastic um, harm. Um, so this is, even if Section 230 in the United States were magically repealed and the internet were subject to all of the forms of legal regulation, defamation and privacy that we now apply to magazines and broadcast media, we would still face these problems. And the good news in this <coughs> is that there is a lot of work for all of us to do. <laughs> That's very emotional for me because that's the reason I became an academic. I, I went to Berkeley and Robert Post was my teacher for the First Amendment. And as you've just heard, the reason why I chose that, you know, lawyer is fine, but an academic is what one should aspire for. So um, what I'm going to be focusing on are four points, minor points. One is what is new, the other the virtual, a word on regulation, and a word or, on normativity. So the structure of Robert's presentation started from the idea that there is something new slash unique. Now one should wonder what makes something new? What is this concept of new? Now, we can talk about new as apart from, so Yochai Benkler would tell us, no, 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 it's just, it's just, you know, it's the problem of uh, polarization or the problem of the broadcast, the cables, and the, the internet is not, is not new in that sense. So that's new as apart from. To what extent are we looking for something that is apart from? We can alternatively say that w what we mean by new is that something is distinct from. Now notice that, that this is clearly part of what you're saying. There is a distinction, but 
an important part of the argument was it's not the first time. It's not, there's nothing new on a deeper level when something like that happens. So printing was, was pivotal to the argument. I think Robert's absolutely right. Not only print, think about amplification, just the concept of amplification. Think about Europe in the 30s and what microphones did when you were talking to large stadiums of people, and then you can talk about passion because of the human voice and, and, the, and the mass, the, the, the physical presence of the masses together. And that could only happen because you had amplifications. So it's distinct from, yet it repeats itself in a way. So the, the concept of, of newness is, is actually not. The, we can talk about new as an additional layer of. So these, these exist, and this exists, and, the, and now there's an additional layer which therefore makes it more robust. That's the idea. It completes something into something different because there's an additional layer. I think there's something there too. But we can also talk about new in the sense of disruptive. It, it's new because it changes something dramatic. It disrupts patterns. It, it disrupts relationships. It disrupts... Uh, ideologies or perhaps connectedness, solidarity, it disrupts something that holds us together, an element of the human condition or the social condition. And because it disrupts that, it could be the market, it be, therefore it is new. We're not yet, yet sure even with respect to that, what is, how should we focus on that which is new in order to find whether or to what extent can we rely on the old, the familiar, the trusted, even a question of expertise, then is it a new type of expertise? Do we need new kinds of experts? Experts on what? So, so this newness is part, of the, is part of the problem. I want to shift from that because from now on, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything new. I don't know if what I said now is new. I'm just going to build on an additional layer of Robert's wonderful presentation. So the question I want to pose now is how should we think about the virtual? Because it's, it's more than the internet. I think part of the question that we're facing is, is it just a matter of context plus technology? Or is there a new dimension that was added to the social condition or the human condition? So when I talk to my kids and I tell them, you got to put this thing down. And if you don't, I will use technology to just shut it down. And then it's going to be just, you know, you could, you're not going to be able to. And they look at me and they say, are you nuts? You just, it's like you asked us to live without the color purple. Like you just, you just took away a segment of our reality within which we live and through which we self-identify actively because of the interconnectedness, because of the graphic designs, because of the illusion of virtuality that sort of makes us believe that part of us exists online. So if it is indeed a new social dimension that has reached a maturity that can make, make us experience, makes us feel that there's something deeply missing in our life if, if this dimension is not there, it's taken from us. And I think the, new, the younger generation feels that very, in an unmediated way, then indeed the challenges are, are, I think, profound. And, and again, I'm building here on, on Robert Post's work when I, when I talk about spheres of speech. Because a for a dimension to be a dimension, it's got to be communicative. Part of what makes something a dimension, a social dimension, is that it is communicative. Mm -hmm. uh, because part of what makes us human is that we are human through our communications, through our languages, through our communication. So when, when Post talk, talks about the distinction between the private and the public, and in fact, it's even more complex. There is the private, the public, and then the bureaucratic or the regulatory space that, that we allocate the state to speak state speech to itself in order for it to be able to govern, which I think is also a component thereof. This too is now virtualized. The state itself is present for its own sake online. We have the algorithmic state now emerging. So there are four dimensions there, space, time, actor, and function. I'm not going to go into all that. Um, it actually, it's similar to the concept of ju jurisdiction, but very briefly, 
Now we have a different kind of space. Its relationship with the physical is complex. Of course, all this virtual actually has a physical component. There are electrons there that are, <laughs> they actually exist on a server that are, so it's very physical. It's just not access to us as something physical. It's access to us as something completely virtual that mimics our world, that, that mimics our world. So um, that creates very weird types of divides. We understand that this is just an imagination. We're not really online. But even the language that we use, we are online. So we, we imagine ourselves into this social new social dimension. Um, and, and there are the different kinds of divides. The digital divide that, that many of us have, have addressed in terms of the haves and the have-nots with respect to access to this new dimension, rural or the <coughs> periphery, the center. There are lots of divides that are central to understanding of this dimension, and therefore they pose legal challenges. Now, beyond the idea of the space, and the space, again, that transcends jurisdictional space, transcends, uh, uh, of course, um, um, sovereign space, um, time works differently. Uh, Robert talks about the reality, the instantaneous transformation, but there's also the other flip, and this is the eternity. The internet or the, so it, you can remember, it, it remember, it does not forget, but, this is, I was going to say, but this is simplistic. Some things it does forget. The question what the internet or the, whatever, the, the virtue forgets or not forgets, this in and of itself is a question. And whether it forgets some things but not others, and whether we will have access to this in the future because technology changes and maybe some things in a weird way, <coughs> we, can ask, we can access the Bible that was printed in 14 whatever, and we might not be able to access something in 50 years' time because the technology changes. So, so the relationship to time, not just to space, to time is very complex. Speakers, who are the speakers? That's a huge, of course, question. Um, what is the corporate speak? And what is the new speak that you speak through design? So, so Tomer mentioned earlier, so we speak through the design of the dimension. There are all kinds of new speaks here. Of course, um, um, there's no, the, the age difference is weird because you can speak to kids. We know that, right? You can speak to kids. Ah, oh, you're 14. Oh, no. So all kinds of bizarre things. Now, new languages emerge. Um, anybody who's been on Reddit would immediately recognize that the language that you speak is different. And of course, the question of whether um, non-English languages, what's going to be of their future, is of course present. Now, AI speaks. And we talked about that. AI speaks in, in weird ways. It's supposed to understand us, predict us, and generate recommendations and narratives. This is a weird type of new speech in that respect. Um, I'm not going to go into all this, uh, all the other the distinctions, but I do want to point that the function of the speech is also blurred. Whether it's private, bureaucratic, what, what function the speech uh, uh, performs is, is also blurred. I want to do stress that in this dimension, the question becomes a question of movement in the, in, the, in the Because as we speak, we move, or we may move from one part of the, uh, or another within this dimension. Um, so what, what are the ways to mobilize ourselves within this speech? Uh, of course, there are those groups, those echo chambers, the gossip rooms or so. Can we migrate from one to another? How do we migrate from one? That becomes a central question, a question of migration. The new migration is not from the old world to the new world physically. It's from one gossip group to another. And how do we do this? It becomes a challenge. And the question is whether speech and privacy doctrines <coughs> should we play a part. Uh, now, we have, should we play a part of that? Surveillance capitalism. Whenever we speak, we are being monitored. Any speech act that we do is monitored because there is money involved but because there are other interests, political interests, national security interests, many interests monitor us uh, as, we, as we traverse this, this new virtual domain. And of course, um, the illiberal tendencies of that were mentioned. I think nowhere, you, you mentioned nowhere, at no point in history before was peace so far reaching. I think also that the notion of surveillance is very 
far reaching. Maybe the church, when you had to go to the priest and confess your sins, could control society in such a way. But but that's but that's about you know that. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say just one word about what it means to regulate because my time my time is running. Um, so here we have we have to revisit theories of regulations as well. So we have classical Habamasian theories of regulation with respect to speech um, that talks about deliberation. But we have another guy that we much that I must <coughs> mention because you know I, I happen to think he's right, and that's Niklas Luhmann, who talks about social systems, and he talks about social systems as sites of social meaning. And now the new technology disrupts also very interestingly what we call social systems. So the market is a social system. Politics is a social system. Religion is a social system. Law is a social system. Art is a social system. And they have their internal logic. Um, so it doesn't mean we can deliberate freely outside of social systems. I don't have the time now to expound on, 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 on Lumen. But technology and the virtual affects this dramatically. Um, so that's part of the challenge that not only law faces, because we don't just regulate through law, we regulate through many other social systems. So therefore, the interaction of law becomes more complex because the demands from law from these other systems, like the market, politics, bureaucracy, um, um, religion, etc., change because of technology. Um, I don't have time to go through the modalities of regulation, there is a lot of theoretical work on what it means to regulate. I do want to conclude with the normative because, again, for time constraints, we talked a little bit here about digital due process and regulation by design, which I think are very important. I do want, um, and, and I just mentioned that, the, so under Lumen, the question of deliberation turns more into contestation because of when you talk through systems, systems communicate. That's the idea of, of, of social systems. So the question is, is a question of interpretation and how do they communicate with each other and how do they contest each other. We talked a little bit about that. I do want to conclude by very briefly addressing some of the six points. So one could say that constitutions per se, and therefore speech protections per se, generate a sense, generate a certain sense of hierarchical belonging. Any constitution says who is a citizen of and therefore is worthy of certain type of rights but not others. So you generate hierarchical belonging. The new technology now, the virtual domain, challenges this hierarchical belonging in, in interesting ways. Therefore, constitutional theory of justice, I suggest, is actually not just about corrective justice or distributive justice a la Aristotelian thinking, it's about this notion of belonging, and therefore it's restorative justice. How do we bridge together cleavages that always occur in society, especially heterogeneous society or hyper heterogeneous society? So the constitution is that which binds us together in a in a ver in a imagined way, and therefore now the challenge is how to build us together through without disrupting the hierarchical belonging. How to build us together in this new age, I think that's part of our um, challenge. This passion, this passionate speech versus passionate speech. This is, of course, a fascinating topic. So constitutions should be um, spheres where we dispassionately talk about structures, but we cannot let go of passion. Because at the end of the day, when we hear that our defense minister was sacked by the prime minister, sort of sack, but it's not about, okay, let's think about it, deliberate about it. Let's say, we rush to the streets. That's it. That's the moment of passion, and it kicks in, and we need to defend the democracy now, immediately. So the, there is a positive element of crowds also that we should find a way to capture and protect. Cosmopolitanism, and again, ten, 10 seconds on that. The aftermath of Second World War had a promise for something that transcends a nation state. The whole idea was, I wouldn't say universal rights, because that's a bit you know, overly ambitious, but at least part of the Western world is about speech. And so cosmopolitan, this cosmopolitan element 
is a natu natural progression of technology. Technology transcends national border. Trans so technology is, goes hand in hand with this part of human rights. So we shouldn't be, we shouldn't um, really wonder, we, we should almost expect there to be this local global tension. Um, I, I, would, I would conclude with, um, I will conclude with, thank you, um, this point about war that I think is fascinating. Because I, I agree with you that law requires human judgment in a way that machines do not uh, exercise, cannot exercise. And if I want to dig deeper, I think what's unique about law is that, there, that, is that there is an unavoidable tension between the rule and the exception. In, for this to be law, there's always law with the possibility that there might be a hidden exception there. And then human judgment kicks in, this mysterious human judgment kicks in. Well, maybe an exception just emerged. Maybe not, but maybe it did. And this the machine cannot do. It's not, it's not, it's not part of it. So our, our uh, uh, challenge now is to maintain the human in the loop in that sense, in law. The tension between the rule and the exception. And therefore, there's a lot of work for us theorists to work on that. Thank you. Thank you, Amnon, so much for these uh, thoughtful comments. Uh, we will take something like 10 up to 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, and uh, they're very, uh, I'm sure, thought, kind of, you know, lots of thoughts. So, so OK, uh, Wolfgang. Thanks. Thanks very much. It was extremely inspiring. Um, just one, one footnote, one uh, observation. I would be interested in your reflections on that, both of you. Um, I think or believe that uh, when we try to understand transformation of communication and of society, we tend to overstate the new. You talked about that, Amon, a little bit. Um, and I would argue that the challenge actually is not so much that we have a change from one stable condition to another stable condition. There was the media society and now the social media society, as you can read sometimes, but rather the uh, concurrency of different states at the same time. So media really plays a role still that has some epistemological authority still. Uh, on the other hand, we have these other forms, and that's true for other social systems as well in the education system. School is still a major uh, socialization agent. Nevertheless, the informal forms of, of education have become uh, more prominent and important. And I think that poses an, an, a, real, a real challenge. And at the same time, we see that um, these conditions are different for different parts of society, young people, older people, but also regions. In Finland, media trust is completely different from media trust in the US, for example. So it's really hard to have one concept, one theory of change applying to all these phenomena, And that has implications for um, uh, social science. So is Luhmann, I've been working with Luhmann a lot, is that still the right theory there? Because it uh, has been developed to understand societies that are in the process of functional differentialization and forming stable sub-systems. Uh, if the state right now is not stable systems, but more blurry things, do we need another concept to better describe this blurriness in this? in a way that is empirically um, uh, valid. And it has implication for regulation as well. Uh, is it still a good thing to define services and then tie some responsibilities and, uh, and um, obligations and, and, and freedoms to that? Or do we need some other concept? I, I don't really know, but I would love to hear some reflections on that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Schulz. Uh, well, I agree with everything you said. I mean, you know, when, when one is modeling a shift, you're always oversimplifying, and of course, what you're saying is correct. If you if you look at traditional media, they exercise enormous influence and power. Still, um, what I think we as academics need to be thinking about, though, is um, one sees a lot of forces toward regulating the internet. Um, this regulation is going to be unintelligent unless we give a precise uh, account of you know what is what, if anything, is causing. Uh, threats to democracy from the internet. So it's something that we need to give attention to without saying it's either or, because of course in the real world, nothing is either or. 
um, in the way in which you describe. So that's, I mean, I think what, I think the issue here is a research agenda, not a set of answers by any means. Mm -hmm. Professor Amir Khoury, please. Uh, yes, good evening to you all. Uh, it seems to me, or at least uh, my impression is that some, uh, there's an opinion that the negativity bias that uh, is in the internet is exasperated by the fact that people are deemed to be uh, the product rather than the client, and the product rather than the client. And if that is true, and if our attention span is actually the fuel that feeds these business models, would it actually not make more sense to regulate it differently vis-a-vis uh, -vis changing the incentive model, i.e. looking at the person as the person and highlighting the positive content as a way to recreate the connection between people vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, actually fueling the negative content and uh, thus not combating negativity but rather changing the paradigm. So, I mean, I, I think it would be, uh, you have to think of a different business model. That's the first thing, of course, that's not small. But second, um, one would have to say, what is the implication of saying to Facebook or Twitter, think of the positive person rather than the, rather than the attention span? I mean, I'm, I'm not clear what that would actually mean in the concrete. Also, I want to say a word for addiction. Um, I, I grew up addicted to television, you know, I still am addicted to television and, you know, I enjoy it. And I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want um, the state to come in and say to people, you can't have this form of pleasure. That strikes me as something we shouldn't do. But then the question of, you know, well, why exactly should we set limits on it? What limits on it? There we have issues of harm and we could talk about, you know, harm to the self-image of persons we could talk about, but we were just talking today about harms to democracy. And I think that the danger to democracy in this is um, the way in which, the ways in which we participate. Amnon, I think, is totally right. There are important things to be said about crowds, you know. Where would France be without its crowds, you know, right now? But um, there also has to be something said for publics, and we need an analysis of what that is and the way in which it's crumbling before our eyes, if it is. And I think it is. I mean, I'm feeling it in my country. I feel the way the public works now and the way it worked 15 years ago, totally different. And the, the, the issue then is, what are the implications for self-governance of that phenomenon? And that's a different issue than treating the person with respect, which I do think should happen, but I don't know actually what that means in the in the context of capitalism, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> Just to follow up on that, we are already a product even before, right, the, uh, the, the internet. I, I do want to touch very briefly on Wolfgang's, very briefly. The yeah. idea, I think you're absolutely right, but part of the problem has to do with the, or that challenge, legal challenge, is that we should expect the multiple layers of media to coexist, at least for the next. But as Robert said, there is a level of embeddedness in the new virtual. So the, on the new virtual, you find the New York Times and you find, you know, Fox, and it's accessible to you through the virtual in, in a seamless way. There's just, yeah, you switch to the New York Times. And then if you're in the, in the ecosystem that actually discredits the New York Times, immediately you would, you would see why it's you know, BS, what they write there, and how you know, they were manipulating you, et cetera, et cetera, but because of, the, of these layers. And this, is why, and this is why it's a challenge. I'd like to talk to you about Lumen later on, because that's. So I'll, I'll jump the line. Yeah. Shelley, please. Um, prerogative of having the mic. Um, you spoke about the epistemological uh, difference, and about the, but my question was ontological. And you talk about a lot um, on conversations. We converse one each other. We have conversation. We have the public. That the newspaper I'm giving it to Talia. But you say conversations are not between people necessarily. We're conversing with bots. Um, so how does that change the mere concept of a conversation, of a speech, that purpose? And uh, later, at the end of your talk, you said, maybe we'll, we'll let the AI battle with each other and then come and, come and get us when you're done. 
the thing is, when they're battling with us, or when we're not, we, we don't know who we are. Um, and the first um, number you chose is that, uh, that Facebook has like 52 billion users in a month. How many of them are real person, real flesh and blood people, and not fake bots or whatever? Um, well, I'm no expert, so I can't tell you, but I think it's in the neighborhood of three billion actual people. Um, I was reading a book by an anthropologist named Dunbar, if any of you know him, about gossip. It was written in the 1990s. And he was saying, you know, everyone, at that point, everyone was like entranced with the internet. It's going to be perfect information flows. We're all going to be so much smarter and we'll have more at our fingertips and the world will be our oyster. And he said, you know, and this is an anthropologist talking. He said, you know, I'm not, this is 1995. He says, I'm not so sure because when we talk to each other face to face, this is an ontology, I carry with me all the social norms that make us have a world in common. When I talk on the internet, I'm abstracted from my world. And he said, you're going to be see people talking, this is his prediction, in ways that are um, disembodied. And that means without social norms. And that means what we have now learned, what trolls are, and the way in which people lose inhibitions. Inhibitions are social norms, which are internalized. Right? You lose inhibitions on the internet because you lack the ontological quality of face to face. And so he said, I'm not so sure the internet's going to add to our store. You're going to see conversations on the internet, he says, which are going to be meaningless and shouting at each other. This is 1995, predicting it in anthropologists. And I think that has something to do with what happens when we lose the ontological reality, you wanted to talk, of face-to-face -face interactions. So the public was always an abstraction. It was a very delicate balance between, on the one hand, the abstraction of a nation state and on the other hand, we were connected in ways that allowed that ontology to proceed. That, that balance is now whacked out in some way. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're, we're facing that down. And that, I think, is an ontological problem, I think. We, we, we would have said that the metaphor of the oyster, we would have spotted that there's a problem there because it's not kosher. <laughs> so, uh, Ishai, please. So thank you for a brilliant presentation. <laughs> Um, and it was really a tour de force. Um, but I think I also spotted some kind of an ambivalence in your rather bleak uh, depiction of where we are, which hid perhaps a worry that we are um, the conservatives um, or the old elites guarding the old guard. Um, in the sense that there is also the, the possibility um, that the internet is bringing further democracy, um, that it spreads knowledge, right? And all these kind of rosier depictions of the internet that you didn't really just out, um, you know, reject. So um, is it also possible that we are witnessing this kind of tectonic shift that you're describing, obviously that is taking place, but instead of viewing it as just a danger for democracy, which requires, um, you know, publics and not crowds, et cetera, et cetera, that actually what we're just seeing is a further move in the continuation of the, um, of the, yeah, of the enlarged franchise to everyone else. So that's one thing. The second um, is from the other direction, which is the Middle Ages. So a lot of what you described kind of sounds like what happened of what existed in the Middle Ages. Of course, not the virality or the speed, so it would be some kind of a Middle Ages um, on steroids, in the sense that, you know, you have the rumors spread through the churches that the Jews have done this, or, you know, that something happens now in Jerusalem and everyone needs now to go and kill someone. Um, obviously not something that we would like to go back to, but there was an order that kept this in place. So, is it also option that what we need to do is to get rid um, of the very kind of short fantasy that it was possible to actually hold all humanity under the same um, um, epistemological authority? Um, and that what we see now is the crumbling of that, but rather than just seeing again kind of um, the downside of it, which obviously we all do, um, seeing some kind of an opening um, again, and it goes in the direction of a greater plurality or, um, or democracy. 
Um, and then what we need to do as intellectuals is to figure out a political structure that would hold this in place. Those are exactly the right questions. I'll tell you an anecdote. You know, in New, in New Haven, this is after the election of Trump, have you all seen The Master Builder by, by Ibsen, you know that play? It's a very Nietzschean play. It's about a, you know, someone who's a, uh, a, I think he's an architect, a master builder, and, and he discovers that the town is covering up uh, poison that's in the baths, and they don't, the, the mayor doesn't want doesn't to lose the tourist uh, uh, industry, and so doesn't tell them. And it ends with this very Nietzschean screed about the people, the masses, forget it. So if this play had happened before Trump, you know, everyone said Nietzsche, bad, blah, 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 blah. This time, this is after the election of Trump. In the United States, people are looking at the, um, the masses. Um, what do we think about that? Uh, and the, to listen to your question, it's like if you think back to John Stuart Mill and how he was terrified by the democratization of knowledge and the triumph of mere opinion. This is Mill talking, the distress of that in the, and the enlargement of the English franchise. Um, I, the, democratization is a very tough thing. Democratization um, and the loss of elite guidance is on the one hand pluralist and it's democratic in the sense of bottom up. On the other hand, it unleashes forces of opinion and populism which are extremely hard to control. And um, when you say the loss of a singular epistemological authority, under, you know, when we have a population the size of the global population now, you have to have division of labor, which means you need specialization. And if you lose specialization, and that's what in the United States we're in the process of losing. When you see the governor of Florida, of a great state, say, I'm going to destroy this university. I'm going to destroy the study of history. It's just like Hungary. You know, if you, when you see that, um, you know that the target, you can call it elite. You can also call it knowledge. <laughs> you know, it's both of those things. There's, and so, I think what we need to be thinking very carefully about is it's not democracy versus, it's democracy is always, has always been some combination. And how that combination works now in the area of knowledge, in the area of opinion production, in the area of politics, in a way that can be stable, that's our challenge. And to, to think about that question is to think about precise forms of intervention which will allow that to flourish. But the minute you think either or, we're dead, because it can't be either or, for obvious reasons. Please join me in thanking uh, <laughs> our distinguished uh, keynote speaker, Professor Poe. Thank you. Uh, uh, at this point, I would like to conclude uh, this amazing uh, day of discussion. Uh, by a few thanks, and then Dr. Bloch has an announcement. Uh, uh, I would like to thank the speakers and chairs and commentators throughout uh, this day. I would like to thank uh, the Shamgar Center uh, for organizing and hosting this conference to Professor Niva Elkin Corin. <laughs> for everything uh, that has happened uh, today, to the Rottenstreich family uh, for assisting in sponsoring uh, this event. I would like to thank uh, Shelley Pasternak and <laughs> Ayelet Crispin Egozi for taking care and making sure that everything works as uh, it should. Um, and now Dr. Bloch has a quick announcement. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I just want to invite you, if you want to um, keep talking to us and to Professor Post, especially about democracy and freedom of speech in our times of democratic crisis, you're all welcome to our uh, tomorrow's event on these topics at 4 o'clock here tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much to the audience as well. Good evening. Bye-bye.